Hi everyone, this is your host, Charlie Dixon, and I'm thrilled to share some exciting news about the upcoming Triad Mental Health Summit Week, happening online from August 20th to the 22nd. This is a free event, and each day will focus on a unique theme, positive change and equality on the 20th, simplifying the pathway to licensure on the 21st, and elevating therapeutic skills on the 22nd. Whether you join us for one day or all three, you'll gain practical knowledge and strategies to enhance your professional growth. Dr. Graham Taylor and I will be hosting live interviews with time at the end to answer your question. Don't miss out on this amazing opportunity. Visit triadhq.com slash TMHS to learn more and register. I can't wait to see you there. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Charlie Dixon. I'd like to welcome back our guest, Dr. Donnell Barnett. Donnell is a counseling psychologist and past president of the Association of Black Psychologists. Donnell has served as the Director of HIV Prevention Programs, Adjunct Professor of Psychology, Behavioral Health Clinic Director, and Chief of Field Investigations and Program Evaluation for the U.S. Army Public Health Center, and an Administrator of Behavioral Health Services with the State of Illinois. His expertise and interests include trauma, the role of faith and wellness, and programs to improve the health and well-being of communities left out of economic and social growth. In our last show with Donnell, we learned about Black psychology and his work with ABCI. Today, we're excited to have him back with us to go a bit deeper from our last discussion around Black psychology and shaping Black mental health. Welcome back to the show, Donnell. Thank you. So glad to be here. Absolutely. Um, And just to refresh our listeners from our previous show, can you give us a quick understanding of what Black psychology entails and why is it important to have a distinct framework for understanding and addressing mental health within the Black community? Wow. Well, thank you. And thank you again for allowing for an opportunity to explore this topic a little bit more. Um, I must say that I am humbled by all of the ancestors, all of the scholars that have gone before me that have built this foundation. And to the extent that I can represent a survey of their thoughts, I'm happy to do that. Black psychology, it's important to sort of understand uh, the origin. Most folks who study psychology as an academic discipline would recognize that it has not always felt very comfortable for Black communities. Um, and, and I would say that about many minoritized communities, but Black communities in particular. And that sort of led folks in ABCI and the Association of Black Psychologists, folks who operate in Black studies, folks who are scholars in Black history, Black educators, right? So this wasn't just an enterprise of psychologists, This was about folks working in a whole variety of academic disciplines that were trying to understand the things that Black folks were encountering and offer a counterpoint, a counter theory, a counter narrative in understanding and explaining the lived experience of Black folks. In so doing, you sort of uh, you sort of pick up on a couple of things. One, psychology strictly Uh, Psychology uh, had a way of defining people broadly and especially Black folks by their deficits, by their weakest points, by areas that when measured against some arbitrary or even normalized standard, right, you know, it, it, it would explain the lives of Black folks in very negative sort of ways. It, it played on stereotypes and tropes that were in the broader society, right? So part of the history of psychology is its complicitness in racism, in ways that penalize 
harm, actively harm uh, folks who are not considered a part of whatever the popular majority is at the time, right? And you you see that whether you are left-handed, red-haired, right? You know, you got freckles, right? You know, at, at different points in history, someone has been the target. Black folks in America have consistently been a target and psychology as a discipline has aligned itself and joined itself with that political thrust. So not to go through the whole history, there's of course published articles around there, uh, but the point is that that sort of began the origin, is recognizing that psychology as we commonly understand it is in fact white psychology built for and by uh, folks of European descent representing uh, their worldviews and values and trying to superimpose that on other folks and other experiences was damaging and harmful. So Black psychology starts from the point of origin that if we articulated a psychological theory, constructs, models from a Black worldview, and we use that as the starting point to explain where folks are and what they're going through, that then takes you back through a series of questions that ultimately lead to our African ancestry and heritage, you know, music and rhythm and movement and spirit and livelihood, right? You know, that's mm -hmm. not just a phenomenon in our modern society that has roots and origins throughout our history. So Black psychology takes us through that journey and that story and tries to pull concepts from our history and think about the lived experience of folks in today's world. Got you. Got you. And you kind of alluded to this, that there are some challenges that that those of us in the black community face when when looking at access to mental health care or just acknowledging a, a certain level of stigma that is there. So can you discuss some more of what those challenges and barriers may be to accessing mental health care for um, black individuals? Yeah, you kind of have to trace it through. So you start with, number one, do folks have access then you start thinking about the economic issues that serves as an entry point to healthcare of any type of healthcare. You know, the disparities there are well documented. Once you have access, then it's about, well, finding someone to work with, right? And so, you know, right now we're in a, a, in a state where wait times and things like that are through the roof for a lot of folks. And for a lot of different reasons, right? But that's the next issue point. So you have, have to have access, then you have to find someone, then you have to be able to get in. And once you're getting in, you're taking a gamble on whether or not that person is steeped in an ideology that sees you as a problem or it comes from a worldview that sees you as another human with failings and giftings, blessings, and so forth. After having gone through trial and error of doing that since Black folks have had access societally for, you know, the last maybe 70 years or so, right? Because you got to remember our grandparents, those who are listening now, our grandparents, Black grandparents, didn't have health insurance by and large, right? right? Didn't have access. And so they may do with what was available in their communities and, you know, that was through churches or other kinds of social ways of community healing. And, you know, of course, we, we've had doctors and things like that. But as and on a large public health scale, those were some of the challenges that those behaviors then show up in the lives of us. You know, those present day where, you know, you're, you're skeptical about going through going to the doctor and all of that. And rightly so. The medical community to include mental health care has been openly hostile to black folks. So once you get through all of that, then that sort of frames the conversation about access, modern day access to care. Those are a lot of gates and barriers to get through just to find someone who can help you. And even then, it's a little bit, you're taking a risk if that person will sort of see you as a human or is going to bring their bias and their stereotypes into the therapy room with you. 
I completely agree with you. So then how does Black psychology address those issues and how would a potential client be able to determine whether someone has that level of ability to see them as a person? Number one, one of the aspects of Black psychology is is a recognition that spirit is in everything. Spirit is in terms of how we are connected to one another, how we're connected to the world and the environment around us. And people, once you enter a room with someone who implicitly gets that, it it has a different feeling in the space, right? It's hard to describe that, but you know, when you're when you're vibing with someone and and you just kind of feel that energy, right? You can you you kind of sense that there is a reason to be at peace and explore a little more. Alternatively, you also sense when someone is skeptical of you, is uh, uh, treats you just like you're another number, right? You know, people feel that energy when they come into the room. So to answer your point, to answer your question, part of black psychology is a it teaches those who are practitioners or those who are learning about black psychology, teaches them about these important concepts that in and of itself is helpful for folks who are looking for help. It also recognizes that the absence of symptoms or the absence of problems isn't necessarily the goal in this kind of in this kind of space. It's about what does healing look like for you and how can I partner with you and align with you to help you get to that. In that process, I'm going to teach you some things about how racism is a factor in health and wellness and, you know, sort of standard, you know, symptomology and that sort of thing. Like that's a part of the conversation, too. But it, it looks at this holistic picture. And then for the person who is getting health, they can say, "Ah," you know, they can breathe a bit, right? You know, Mm -hmm. someone who understands that, yes, I've got some depression stuff going on, but I also dealing with, you know, this jerk at my, at my, at work, right? You know, and who's coming, who's talking to me in ways that sort of minimizes the, the identities and the realities of who I am. Completely understand that. So I am a practicing social worker. um, And so a lot of our educational programs have a center of focus on cultural competency. So a lot of this does give me the feels of black psychology. Can you discuss like the concept of cultural competency as it relates to access to mental health treatment and maybe even similarities and differences between the two concepts of black psychology and cultural competence? Yeah. So um, how much time do we have? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I did just drop a big one. (laughs) Right, right, right. Let me try to make this concise. Um, So cultural cultural competency, let me start by saying, firstly, Black psychology is not cultural competency. And cultural competency is not Black psychology. Black psychology is an academic discipline that has its own a system of science of un- uncovering knowledge and information. It's a discipline. It has a, uh, a sort of defined way of understanding. Ha- we, the Association of Black Psychologists, we have our own code of ethics. So it is a professional discipline um, in the way that any other field of study is. Cultural competency is really a, a an attempt to try to make existing knowledge relevant to folks who come into your therapy office or um, your consultation space or your school, your classroom, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, Part of the fallacy of cultural competence is just think about on its surface, how can I ever be competent about you? Right. Right. I mean, I'm 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 barely competent about myself. Right. <laughs> right. You you sort of understand how that is. Uh, that That's deeply problematic. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate the uh, the recognition and the attempt to try to be more knowledgeable about someone else's lived experience. But this is also why the frame cultural humility has come more to the fore, because it recognizes that, A, 
I, I, I may not know everything that I need to know about you in order to assist you effectively, but I also appreciate the fact that there's a lot that I need to learn from you in order for us to partner on your goals and what you've come to see me for. Okay. So is there a way then to, to ensure that mental health professionals are adequately trained and equipped on understanding and, and addressing specific needs or experiences of those in the Black community? Yeah, it's a, it's a journey. And so I would say folks would have to continue to learn. First, it's recognition that what you've been taught in school is very likely not adequate to work with folks from different backgrounds and different worldviews and from different perspectives. So it is that humility part. It is also appreciating all of the intersectional issues that impact folks, right? So it's not just I'm depressed because someone died or, right, you know, some of those traditional things that you might see in a DSM kind of context. Mm -hmm. It is a recognition that there are many things that's infringing on my um, liberation, my freedom, my my, uh, sense of wellness and and how that's defined. And that takes a good bit of learning, of understanding what are all of these pieces that come into the picture and recognizing that me myself, that you know, I've been steeped in a culture that feeds me information about people, about myself, and I have to be very mindful of how I bring that into someone else's healing journey. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Continuing education is both a requirement and a learning opportunity, but finding the right CE provider can be challenging. AATBS, a triad company, offers continuing education for psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, counselors, and behavior analysts. CE courses are available both individually and as part of our new All Access Pass. All Access Pass provides a library of over 250 unique courses. That's more than 800 hours of CEs, with new courses being added every month. As a special offer, Behavioral Health Today listeners can save 15% on CE purchases. Visit us at aatbs.com slash BHT and enter promo code BHT15 during checkout. That's aatbs.com slash BHT. Check out our library and check off your CE requirements today. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And so then are there specific therapeutic or particular therapeutic techniques or interventions within Black psychology, within that particular discipline that you find to be especially helpful um, in promoting healing? The uh, ones that has has a great deal of prominence is optimal conceptual theory um, uh, advanced by Dr. Linda James Myers. And she sort of talks about how we we have grown up in a worldview that is foreign, that is alien to us, that centers competition, it centers wealth, it centers how I can be better than other folks, right? And helps people to realize how those values that's common in a capitalistic sort of society, in a a Eurocentric and capitalistic society, how those issues impact us from a health and wellness standpoint. And so the process helps people to recognize that that's what's going on with them and then brings them to a worldview that is more in line with their culture, with their values. And in so doing, you alleviate a number of the kinds of common behavioral health challenges that folks experience. So that's optimal conceptual theory. There is uh, into uh, theory, into theory is based largely on the principles of the Nguzu Saba um, that sort of emphasizes those values. The Nguzu Nguzu Saba, um, uh, most folks may be familiar with the the frame Kwanzaa, uh, the principles of Kwanzaa, the principles of the Nguzu Saba, uh, as a way of giving people sort of a foundation of how you move towards wellness. So how are you working uh, in a collective way with people? How are you centering faith? in your life? How are you centering, you know, those kinds of values as a way of bringing 
of alleviating what would be considered mental health problems or mental health concerns. Okay. Okay. And, and there's a number of other models that sort of apply principles out of black psychology, but from a therapy standpoint, those are uh, just a couple um, that have really built on the foundation of the black and African psychology scholarship. Got you. So it seems though, that there is a lot of um, emphasis on community um, and trying to, to reach the community, um, the black community as a whole um, through this discipline. So are there certain steps that individuals or maybe even communities at large can take to prioritize mental health from the lens of black psychology? Yeah, so uh, that's that's really foundational to what we're talking about. So across the African diaspora and on the continent, one of the things that scholars ha who work in this area have learned and really tried to uncover is the principle of Ubuntu, which you know, which says, "I am because you are; you are because I am," and it emphasizes that that interconnectedness between people is critical to, to everything. If you take that concept and, and we contrast Ubuntu with sort of a Western idea that says, I think, therefore I am right. You know, mm -hmm. the, that individualistic versus sort of a collectivistic or community sort of worldview. If you take that as an example, uh, as a foundational part of I am because you are and that interconnectedness, then all interventions or modalities will be built on that foundational principle. Mm -hmm. So what healing often looks like in a community space, it is bringing people together in a circle that sort of centers a conversation around what our shared experiences are and how we can assist and support one another. It's bringing people into uh, traditional communal spaces, whether it's a barbershop or beauty salon or, or church or a sports team or, you know, social organization, Greek organization, right? You know, whatever it is, it's using that uh, natural connectedness to talk about problems and center solutions as opposed to our traditional model that says, you individual make an appointment with me and right. And we're going to work this out in a one on one kind of way. Right, right, right. So then let's let's speak to early practitioners. What I found to be interesting is that the Association of Black Psychologists, it appears to have started with a lot of student involvement. So as one that may be an early career practitioner or maybe even a student that might be interested in this type of research around black psychology, what advice might you have for them? How can they contribute to the field? How can they take this discipline? And maybe even even if they're not even a, a psychologist, maybe they're a social worker or an educator, how do they bring um, this type of framework to their practice? Yeah. So get involved, get involved, whether it's the Association of Black Psychologists, the National Association of Black Social Workers, mm -hmm. Black Psychiatrists of America, um, and then a whole range of other organizations that really sort of center African thought and African wisdom and how it's applied to our lives. So that's, that's the first point is to get connected and get involved. From there, you will find the resources, the literature, the articles, the books, the documentaries, the, the YouTube videos, right? You know, all of those things to kind of help you get caught up, <laughs> right? Because there's a lot to get caught up on, yes, yes. especially when you've gone through four or five years of graduate school mm -hmm. that maybe there was a topic in one class on right on this, right? Maybe. maybe. Right. So you, you got to spend some time getting caught up on the foundation. Then you can you'll have access to other discrete training opportunities where you can take on um, a lot of this. We are fortunate that a lot of our uh, foundational scholars that really pull the information together to establish this discipline, a lot of them are still with us. And so, you know, you go to a conference, you might bump into Linda James Myers or oh. Naeem Akbar or, you know, Wade Nobles, right? You know, you may bump into them and get to ask them a question about, well, when you wrote this book, what were you thinking, right? You, so you really, it's, it's engaging and connecting and the professional associations is a great 
way and space to do that. Nice. Um, something that I that might be um, slightly controversial, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So is black psychology only for black people? Are only black pr- practitioners, should we be the only people that have access to it? Why or why not? Yeah, so that that's kind of an open question. There are certainly uh, folks who believe that we need our own stuff and we need it for ourselves and we need to protect it at all costs. There are others who sort of take this point that if scientifically we believe that the origin of humankind is in Africa, if we accept that premise, then it's not hard to make the leap that anything that comes out of Africa is for the world, right? Because mm-hmm. that 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 is the origin. Mm-hmm. So, right, you know. So I, I I I can't say one way or the other. I'm just articulating viewpoints here. Understood. But you know that dynamic does exist. Uh, I I think in in practice we all recognize none of us live in exclusive anything spaces yeah. all the time. Right. Right. And there is a certain humanity that comes out of African wisdom that says, regardless of your phenotype or what you look like, I am still compelled to see you as another human on this human journey. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that baseline kind of understanding, but the dynamics around for us and by us and 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 the dynamics around this is a sort of a global understanding that certainly does exist. It does. It does. And I just was curious on what your your particular thoughts are on that. So thank you for articulating that for me. To that point, so I don't do much therapy these days. I'm the administrator. Okay. But even in the work that I do, when I'm reviewing a grant application or when I am working with a contractor or a vendor or uh, uh, or I'm thinking about designing a program or collaborating, I'm bringing those principles into the space. I'm thinking about uh, my work as it, whether it's consulting or speaking engagements or whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm bringing that into the space. One, because it's often not represented. And two, uh, because I think it it adds a, a contribution to the discourse and to the conversation that gives balance and harmony to uh, whatever intervention or activity we're talking about. So there is a certain degree of operating from this space. And let me just make this one point that I think is really, really uh, um, important. Unlike Western psychology, which has Western psychology and application of psychology, where it has always sort of kept this division between the therapist and the patient, right? Yes. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about boundaries and ethics mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, uh, what's the Freudian thing, you know, transference and right, yes. right. We, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about that in our graduate programs as if, you know, we are doing something to people, right? We're going to apply this evidence base, whatever. Black psychology says that I, as the clinician, I I necessarily have to do my own evolution um, in order to operate effectively in this space. And that does require uh, a certain level of joining with my my patient uh, or client or whatever language you want to use. And so uh, particularly for Black clinicians, um, if you have not begun that journey then what you're ultimately going to offer is white therapy in blackface. And so yeah. that's a that's a, a, a really important part that I think is maybe as controversial, but gets to part of the point that you were raising. Nice. OK, thank you for that. So how do you see the field of black psychology growing? How does it evolve in the future? What are some opportunities for growth, development, um, you did also mention that there were other national organizations um, of Black practitioners. How do they work together? Tell us about the future. Uh, so we are um, doing a number of things. We have we have an active workforce initiative. Um, as as if you've been following, uh, you know the broader conversation around mental health services and care. 
Um, there's just not enough folks to go around. Right. And when she started peeling back the layers on disparities between uh, different racial ethnic groups, then, you know, there's a lot of work that's needed. So in ABCI, some of the things that we have done is partnered with programs to help people pass the licensure exam to make some improvements there. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we published the first black mental health workforce report in partnership with Black Psychiatrists of America and the National Association of Black Social Workers. Part of that is intended to inform and make clear whether you're on a state psychology board or you are an internship site director or whatever the case is, is to help people understand what are some of the unique struggles um, that folks are encountering as they're making their journey in the mental health workforce pipeline. We have, uh, of course, we have forums and things like that to sort of talk about some of these issues, but all of these are a part of growing that workforce and how people get into the discipline. Once they get in, then we have uh, ways of nurturing through uh, what some people may call mentorship programs uh, to pair them with seasoned professionals that helps them, one, to get through the hoops, but also begin that introduction to what is it this thing that we're talking about that's different from what you learned in school and helping them along that journey. This is how we grow numerically the workforce, but there's a, also a conversation around growth in terms of thought growth. And right. that is um, folks who enter academic departments into training spaces, into conferences and other kinds of leadership spaces to advance a thought and worldview that's centered in this collection of values and this uh, this this type of discourse. So m more people are becoming introduced to some of the concepts that ABCI has been talking about for decades. Hence, you know, <laughs> we're having this conversation now in part because folks are becoming more aware of what's available and what's out there. And that is also growth in addition to the numerical growth that I uh, was just talking about. Okay. You mentioned a few minutes ago that there is a, um, a national conference. Can you tell us more about that? Oh yeah. It's a, it's a party like you've never had. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ABCI, the association of black psychologists, we will be in Phoenix this year. Yep. And um, it is, it is in part, a traditional conference. It's in part a family reunion. It okay. is in part a place of respite. Uh, folks that are coming from community clinics and academic departments and government spaces, and they've been, uh, they have racial battle fatigue. You mm -hmm. can come to a place like the ABCI conference to let your hair down and be your beautiful self be re-energized and engaged and learn something in the process. Um, the National Association of Black, Psych Black Social Workers, you know, those are our, our, our cousins. The experience at their conference is the same and so true as uh, Black Psychiatrists of America. And then, of course, there are a number of other organizations that's doing something similar, creating spaces that's, that really sort of has those three elements. It's training opportunity, it's networking, but it is also a healing space and it's a space for uh, growth and development. Nice. I will have to look up those, the conferences. I've heard about the social work one, but I've never had the opportunity to attend. So I definitely, the, the way that you described it, it makes me need to go. Uh -huh. so I'll definitely want to, to look Pull into up. them. Definitely. So um, before we before we get to a close today, can you um, share a message um, that you'd like to convey to our listeners about the importance of Black psychology and its role in shaping Black mental health and well-being? Practitioners in this space, we recognize necessarily and unequivocally that we have to be in community spaces. One of the first major publications that came out of ABCI it's a classic piece written by Dr. Joseph White, one of our founders. He published one of those first pieces in Ebony Magazine. And that was a very intentional, intentional act was to say that, you know, we want our statements and our information to be in the public space and to make it accessible 
and uh, for our communities to to be able to really embrace what it is that we're talking about and what it is that we're that we're offering to uh, what's our role in the collective conversation of healing and repair. And so uh, in that vein, it is uh, whether you are a, a faith leader or you're a coach um, or you're just a neighborhood person that really has a burden for your community, we invite you to our conference as well. Uh, invite you to get a subscription to the Journal of Black Psychology. Invite you to look up our online magazine, The Psych Discourse, where I uh, invite you to check out our podcast on Facebook, uh, creating Zola Monday. You know, we invite you to all of these opportunities so that you can go back into whatever your space is and to share these messages with people. There, there will never be a scenario where a bunch of professionals are going to really be able to accomplish all the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It will always be and necessarily at the community level with folks who love us um, and really want the best for us to carry that message and be the protector, if you will. There's a couple concepts that I'm thinking of, but uh, African concepts around people who are appointed and understood to be the protectors and the guardians of the culture. And so uh, if you occupy that space, however it is you occupy that space, you too can be a part of this and to begin to share that message in our collective healing. Nice. You just mentioned a few ways, but I will I will ask you again to highlight them. Where can our listeners learn more about Black Psychology and ABSI? Yeah, so uh, www.abpsi.org is our website, ABSI. And from there, you will find the Journal of Black Psychology. Uh, the Journal of Black Psychology is an, a traditional academic journal. Um, so you will find, you know, uh, different types of research articles, theoretical pieces, and so forth. Uh, but that is one place where you'll have access to that information. If uh, you can go to our Facebook page, the uh, ABCI Facebook page, and there you'll be able to follow the Creating Zola Monday podcast, where every other Monday they're having hot topics around okay. uh, what's going on in the culture, but from a Black and African psychology perspective. Uh, we are in the process of launching a new initiative, the ABCI Global Institute, where we will make courses, webinars, and those kinds of things available to really anyone uh, where you can get, you know, you can take a deep dive into any particular topic. And that, you know, some, most of that will be free. Some of it is, uh, has a, has a price. Uh, you can get CEUs and things like that. Uh, CEs as a part of that process as well. But though, depending on where, how you're entering the space, there's something for you, whether you are a professional um, in this, or it's, you know, something that you're interested in, or you're, uh, you're a lay professional in the sense that you got a full-time job somewhere else, but you're also <laughs> trying to do this and you're trying to figure out how to bring those things together. There is something for you, no matter how you enter the space. Nice. Well, thank you so much. I know I really appreciated speaking with you today. Thank you. Thank you. This has been really fun. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you to our listeners for taking the time to join us. The resources for this episode and an archive of all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. We look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tried Behavioral Health Network, all rights reserved.